welcome to this act of worship on this Good Friday. Special welcome to Joanna Fincher, who joins us to lead our singing today. Joanna has been here before with the vocal group Call during one of our Sunday afternoon concert series, and we're delighted to have her with us today. Friends, we gather on this most sacred day to remember that most sacred event and to offer God our worship and our praise. Let us pray. Almighty God, we praise you for your redeeming love revealed in all its powerful weakness in the cross of your son Jesus. Humbly, we acknowledge all that you have done for us in Christ. As we bow in penitence before the cross, we gratefully acknowledge the debt we owe for ours was the sin he bore, ours the ransom he paid, ours the salvation he secured. Touch our hearts anew, we pray, with the power of your eternal love, and keep us ever near the cross. For Jesus' sake, amen. <laughs> we join in a prayer of confession. Almighty God, your Son Jesus endured the cross for our sake and offers us forgiveness for all our sin. May he who was mocked forgive us our faint-heartedness before the critics of our faith. May he who was denied forgive us when our behavior contradicts our Savior's teaching. May he who readily forgave those who sinned against him forgive our failure to forgive those who wrong us. May he who died for us forgive us for our hesitation to live for him. We humbly offer this our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first scripture this morning is from John 13, 1 through 9. Jesus expresses his love by selfless service. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. 
And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Amen. Our second reading is from John chapter 19, verses 9b through 30. Pontius Pilate arranges the crucifixion and Jesus embraces it. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was a day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king, they cried out. Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the the cross, It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
were you there? When they crucified my Lord, the African-American spiritual asks that pointed question in very pointed ways. There is the poignant shock of the soaring O expressing the wonder of it all, followed by the sobering reminder to tremble, 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 all pointing to the enormity of what happened at Calvary. And the song invites us to enter into the story of Good Friday and look for ourselves somewhere in it. And certainly we were there, at least in the sense that we behave the way the people in the story behaved. Start, perhaps surprisingly, with Judas, who betrayed Jesus and whose name has become synonymous with treachery. Why he did it remains a puzzle, maybe more so than we realize, because how he did it is perplexing. He identified Jesus in the darkness of the Garden of Gethsemane by giving him a kiss, according to one gospel writer, a tender kiss. And then afterwards, he went out and hanged himself. One commentator said he was bad enough to have done the deed and good enough to be unable to bear the burden of what he had done. And that enigma has led to all sorts of theories about Judas. Did he perhaps believe that Jesus was Messiah, but in a political sense? Did he arrange for the arrest of Jesus in hopes that that would force Jesus' hand and make him launch the rebellion against Rome that Judas hoped for? If that should be the case, then Judas stands in the story as the disciple who wants Jesus to do things his way, to fulfill his hopes and endorse his plans. Haven't we all at times done that? Not as drastically, not as tragically, to be sure, but nonetheless a failure in discipleship in as much as we are at times unwilling to let Jesus be Lord and take charge of our lives and change our lives. Been there, done that, like Judas we were there. Then there's Caiaphas. Caiaphas appears in the story as the classic eminence grace, the pastor politician used to gliding smoothly through the corridors of power. Some scripture reference conveniently at hand to justify the course of action he approved of. The end always justifies the means in Caiaphas's book. So when the gospel records Caiaphas and his colleagues saying to Pilate, we have no king but Caesar, we see political expedience and opportunism at its ugliest, most deceitful, most self-serving. 
a somber reminder that mixing politics and religion is often one small step from betrayal. Let's think of Peter. He denied Jesus and his tears reveal his shame. We all know that. John's gospel, though, fascinatingly, lets us see how that happened. From the garden, all the disciples had fled. But one of Jesus' disciples, John, had insider connections that got him into the courtyard of the high priest and close enough to observe what was happening. Peter followed and joined his colleague. Who knows what he thought he might do? No doubt he hoped to offer some resistance in some way, just as in the garden. It was Peter who pulled a sword and tried to prevent the arrest. Or perhaps he was stealing himself to keep his earlier promise to be ready to die with Jesus. Sadly for Peter, that was not to be. He longed to be available for a heroic struggle. Instead, he found himself in the role of a helpless bystander. He didn't have to stand before the governor, just to stand among a crowd of curious people. Jesus faced a capital charge. Peter faced a curious question, several of them. And then he found his courage failed. He couldn't do it. Haven't we been there? Eager to serve, but fearful of the cost. Willing to witness, but somehow the words just wouldn't come or the Opportunity had passed before we had the chance to seize it. Disciples of faltering courage and hesitant conviction, we sometimes are. And if so, just like Peter, we were there. The Jewish religious leaders present a telling example of the irony of the human condition. They are engaged in railroading an act of heinous injustice, to say the least, something which on any other day would have been identified as a, a contradiction of their faith. And yet in other ways, they were scrupulously religious we didn't re read the detail in John's gospel today, but there comes a point when Jesus is before Pilate, when Pilate is, to fo is forced to go outside to engage with the Jewish religious leaders because for them to enter the pagan headquarters would have defiled them and tainted their celebration of Passover. Earlier in his ministry, Jesus had criticized them for straining an insect while at the same time swallowing a camel. And in Jesus' final days, that characteristic is in full display. But once we think about it like that, we come to see that Often it is easy to be selectively religious. You know, scrupulous in some detailed observance of our faith. Usually an issue that carries little temptation for us. While at the same time, ignoring the weightier, deeper issues, and the call to full discipleship and unreserved commitment. We need to ask if we have ever sought 
to keep our faith only on terms that suited us and ignored faith's deeper challenges. To do so means that alongside the religious readers, we were there. And then there's Pilate. I think we need to be at least a little fair to Pilate. His was the inenviable task of presiding at a trial whose verdict was already determined. He found Jesus unsettling, disturbing. But really, Pilate didn't have much of a chance. He was like a driver whose car is stuck in mud. And the more he revs his engine, the more he spins his wheels, and the deeper his wheels go in the mud. He was stuck. He knew the right thing to do, but the problem was it was difficult. It was unpopular. It could be misinterpreted. It might even lead to Caesar relieving him of his job. And in that sense, isn't there a bit of pilot in all of us? Days when we know the right thing but feel it's just too hard. The people we know of or the people we have to deal with might disrespect us or criticize us or call our motives in question. And that might put us off. Our friends might turn against us. Our boss might fire us, so we say nothing or do nothing. And each time we act like that, we act like Pilate. We were there. And then the Roman soldiers, a callous lot. Their job made them so. An army of occupation is always an awful military assignment. Then, as now, think Afghanistan and the risks our troops still encounter there. Back then in Judea, with the risk of zealot assassination, a constant threat, It was easy for Roman soldiers to protect themselves by building resentment to those whose land they occupied. And that often bred a cruelty that certainly found expression in prisoner abuse. Were we there for that? We only have to look this week to Minneapolis to see the answer. The searing testimony we are hearing about the death of George Floyd forces us to recognize to our shame the ready way our culture lives by violence, both the violence of excessive policing and the violence of reactive protests, not to mention the never-ending list of those who die by gun violence in our land. We were there. We are there. But meanwhile, Near the cross, the first shoots of new growth are breaking through the ground. We see the first signs that the passion of Jesus offers new beginnings. Mary loses her son after the flesh. 
but Jesus gives her a new family belonging. Even on the cross, we see that Jesus, as he dies, is thinking not of himself, but of others. Having loved his own who were in the world, John has told us, he loved them to the end. And Jesus' shout of triumph, it is accomplished, means that what on the surface looks like a cacophony of all that is wrong in the world, cruelty, injustice, betrayal, violence, and death, cannot and will not ever defeat God's love. Jesus' victory on the cross invites us to trust to accept his offer of forgiveness and believe even though we can't exhaust the full meaning of what transpired that day. And that makes it important to acknowledge we were there because there is our salvation. We know the cross is not the end. We believe the love that triumphs there. The light of the cross reveals the darkness of the human scene and in some ways some darkness in our hearts, but floods that darkness with the light of love divine and God's offer of full forgiveness. And while we hated to be there when they crucified our Lord, the thought takes root that there is nowhere else we'd rather be. Nowhere else where God's deep love could make so powerful an appeal. Let us pray. O Savior of the world, who died upon the cross for our salvation, help us see ourselves in the sacred story, to see our sins and failures exposed in the light of your deep love, and there forgiven. Make us grateful for the power of your forgiveness, so that humbled by the cross, we may be haunted by its redemptive power and eager for the new life Easter brings. And so in gratitude, we bow before you, loving God, the creator who has given us our lives and the redeemer who has given our lives back again when we had forfeited by our sin our status as your children. Accept our thanks and praise. We humbly pray for your love's sake. Lord Jesus Christ, you did not shrink from pain and death for us. You endured the deep darkness of the cross. We do not understand the full meaning of your death for us, but we are moved to humble thanks and sorrowing praise that you should love us in this way and through the cross should make us whole and new. Accept our thanks and praise. We humbly pray for your love's sake. Holy Spirit of God, you take the truth of Christ and bring it to our hearts. Move in our hearts and minds, we pray. Show us Christ upon his cross and teach us we are loved, accepted, and renewed. And give us faith and love and peace this holy day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Eternal God, you love the world in Christ. Hear us as we pray for all who are betrayed, deserted, hated, or despised, especially those who suffer thus for Jesus' sake. We pray for all who are in pain, in sorrow, or in grief, those who are alone and those who need the strength of faith. Grant to all such the peace of your presence, the assurance of your love, and a foretaste of your victory over evil through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, we also pray for all who hate you, despise you, ignore you, or resist you in their lives. And we would ask for grace so to live the life of faith that the attractiveness you offer can shine even through us. Lord, on this day we remember your ancient people in the Middle East, Jew and Arab. Heal the violence constantly simmering, we pray. Remove the age-old enemies and bring peace and reconciliation and a new beginning for that troubled region. Holy God, in your love for all your children, Work in all your children's lives, your purpose and your will, we pray. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Uh, together we pray. Eternal God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, triumphed in death on the cross that he might win life for all the world, help us to overcome all evil in the power of his victory and to glory in his cross alone. For he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And now, may the blessing of the eternal God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Amen. <laughs>